And then I'd also like to welcome uh, Dr. Katherine Nelson. If you want to come on up here too, let's give her a hand. <laughs> So Dr. Uh, Catherine Nelson Murphy, she has an extensive background in education, prevention, and wellness. Um, she's worked in healthcare for nearly 40 years. Actually, almost 50, now. Almost 50? <laughs> woo! <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. Um, she's had the privilege of helping numerous people improve their health and well-being, and she possesses expertise in bioidentical hormone replacement, thyroid management, which I think we're going to hear about tonight, um, adrenal fatigue, cardiovascular prevention, and primary care. We're so excited to have you here um, to interview her and hear more about thyroid and hormonal health and innovative new ways that these conditions are being treated. So thank you, Dr. Nelson, for being here. Okay. Um, yes, I am extremely excited to interview Dr. Katherine Nelson. She is a, um, one of those medical professionals who bought in uh, way before the rest of us did. So, you know, uh, we, we were able to just learn a lot from, from you and from pioneers in our city. And so you've blazed the trail for many of the rest of us. And I want to thank you for that. And I am really excited to interview you tonight. Okay. So let's just jump right in there. Okay. Um, tell us more about your professional background and then what led you to do what you're doing now. Okay. Um, I've been in healthcare going on 50 years now. Uh, I worked as a registered nurse, mostly emergency department, and then went on to get my nurse practitioner degree, a naturopathic degree, and then another doctorate in um, nursing education. Worked primary care for a lot of years as a nurse practitioner and just found Women weren't validated, women weren't listened to, that traditional medical model, what's your symptom, here's a pill, see you in a year, um, come back if you're not better, but I don't know what to do with you, so let's send you to a psychiatrist or a specialist, and so the story goes on and on. Uh, then I started seeing a lot of menopausal women, and never felt well. These women didn't feel well. They come in, nobody's listening to me. I tell them I'm having this and this, and you know, they're on Premarin, which is pregnant horse urine. I thought, okay, that makes no sense. And you know, women that had had partial hysterectomies or full hysterectomies told by their gynecologist, well, you don't have a uterus, here's some estrogen, you'll be fine. Come back, they're not fine, they feel worse, nobody's listening to them. So then again, I thought there has to be something better than this and started to do some research, went to some conferences and learned more about bioidentical hormones, which I've been prescribing now for probably a good 25 years to patients. Yes, yes. I love sending referrals up to the Happy Hormone <laughs> Cottage. You and Dr. Blevins and uh, Sherry and Laura, I love you mm -hmm. all. Um, let's talk about the thyroid. Okay. Um, we're so excited to hear about that. Tell us what are the basics mm -hmm. um, and what are some symptoms someone might be experiencing if they're not, if their thyroid is not performing optimally. Okay, perfect. So I do have a handout there, some slides that I made. Sometimes it's a little easier to look at some pictures and pathways and to try to see it in your brain as I'm describing it. Um, so the first page you see is, a, is the thyroid gland itself. This is found in the front of the neck. So if you feel your own neck, you shouldn't be able to feel your thyroid. It kind of sits right here near your Adam's apple. You shouldn't be able to feel that thyroid. So when the doctor feels along in here, feeling to see is that thyroid enlarged? Do we feel any nodules or cysts? Sometimes you can look at a person and you see them with a big goiter. You know, I'm always at the grocery or at the store thinking, do you know you have a thyroid issue? I can, I can help you out there. Uh, <laughs> um, but you shouldn't be able to feel it. So people who have some thyroid issues, often that thyroid is enlarged. It feels a little lumpy or you can feel some nodules. Patient says, oh, it kind of hurts a little bit to swallow or I feel like something gets stuck in my throat. So that's where the thyroid gland is located. The thyroid itself 
is really the master gland of the body. So people, patients will come in and say, oh, I know there's something wrong with my thyroid because I can't lose weight. Well, that might be a small part of it, but the thyroid does a whole lot more than that. So it does metabolize the foods that we eat. It extracts vitamins and nutrients from the food and gets it to various parts of the body where, that, where it's needed. It directs cellular activity. It has to do with your DNA. It transcribes, uh, regulates the production of ATP, which is the energy source in your mitochondria. So when patients present with symptoms of hypothyroid, I always say think of everything in your system as being slowed down or sluggish. So start with the top, from the top. So you're foggy. You can't think well. You can't find words. You lack concentration. You have dry hair, you're losing hair. Your skin is dry. Your fingers are cold. Your toes are cold. You're clumsy. A lot of people don't think of that as a thyroid symptom, but everything is slowed down. Quite often there's some GI issues, food sensitivities, bloating, constipation, uh, decrease in libido is very common, sleep disorders. So again, I tell, think of everything as just slowed down or sluggish. Certainly, low metabolism, some people, you know, rapid weight gain because that thyroid is really dysfunctional, but it's not all that it does for the body. <laughs> Want to hear me? Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Israel. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's so interesting. How many people would you say are walking around with these symptoms, but just don't even realize it or think about it? Oh, I think a lot. <laughs> of course, I see it a lot because that's what I do. But, um, you know, again, a lot of times patients will go to their family doctor, you know, I'm just so tired. Well, you have kids, uh, you have a job, you're, you're really busy, you know, particularly middle-aged women that really sandwich generation, maybe the aging parents that they're caring for and working and still have kids. And so, you know, they kind of get dismissed as, well, of course you're tired. Well, I'm always cold. Well, you know, a lot of people are cold. You know, they don't, people don't think to check their basal body temperature mm -hmm. to be able to come in and say, look, I've been tracking my temperature for the last month. It registers 96, 97, you know, very common symptom of hypothyroid. You mentioned that it's mostly women, or you mostly mentioned women. women. So any thoughts around why that might be? No. <laughs> uh, but it is much more common in women than men. Community, too. Very much so. Yeah. Seven to one. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so um, tell us more uh, just about the, um, tell us more about testing. Okay. What would be standard? What would be considered um, standard testing for thyroid? And then what do you offer? Right. So there is a handout on that, and it's easier to kind of follow that along. So if you do go to a family practitioner, maybe the gynecologist even will do some thyroid testing. Typically what they look at is a TSH, which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, and maybe a T4. Well, a TSH by itself means truly nothing. So if you look at that paper, it says, how does the thyroid work? So that TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, has to stimulate your thyroid gland to produce T4 hormone. You have a total level of that T4. Your body then converts it to a free level. Then your body converts that to T3, a total level of T3, and then that converts to a free level. So what the body can use is free T4, free T3, but T3 is the active part of thyroid. T4 is the inactive part. So you go to the doctor, they do a TSH, maybe they do a T4, and that's it. Everything is fine because they're not following the rest of that pathway. Then we have a marker called reverse T3, which can block some of the T3 activity. So it's important to get that whole pathway to really make an informed decision. Is this person having hypothyroid? Do they need thyroid treatment? So when you look at these panels, um, what are the key elements that you tend to really zero in on um, 
So I don't care so much about the total levels. Um, I care about what the free levels are. And then I mostly am concerned about the reverse. So a person can have normal, maybe their T3, T4, TSH all look normal, but they have a really high reverse T3. So their body is blocking everything they're making. So they're still going to exhibit symptoms of hypothyroid. But again, if that's not looked at, they're going to be told everything's fine. And do you know why the body would be blocking what they're making? Why that reverse T3 <laughs> tends to go up like that? Very common in women. Um, very common with viruses or bacterial insults. We've seen, oh, I've seen such a mess with thyroid after COVID. Really has wrecked havoc. Uh, people who are on thyroid really have changed what their dosing needs are, but also that viral insult has really kind of driven that reverse T3. And then, of course, there's some food and environmental things I think we're going to talk about here. Um, so uh, we'll just do a little tiny segue over to COVID because you <laughs> brought that up, and that's mm -hmm. something that you know many of us have been wondering, why do some people get this or that with COVID and others don't? And so as it relates to the thyroid, you mentioned that you're seeing more changes with that. How, mm -hmm. if you put a percentage on it, what that increase is or it's, what? It's more common in patients who do have Hashimoto's or the autoimmune thyroid. So you know, anything autoimmune means the body's attacking itself. We don't understand everything about autoimmunity. I know we'll talk about that in, a, in just a few minutes, but um, those people seem to be at a greater risk of more issues with their thyroid post-COVID. But again, there's really no rhyme or reason to COVID. <laughs> it really runs the gamut of, you know, I would never have expected that with this particular person. You know, they seem quite stable on their dose, and then you do some labs, and everything is completely out of balance. Yeah, we just need to learn a lot more about, you know, what happened with COVID and those spike yeah. proteins. But, um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about treatment. What would be the difference between a standard treatment and then what you would offer? Mm -hmm. So typically standard treatment is um, T4. So I'm sure many of you have heard of Synthroid or the generic form levothyroxine. And that's kind of the standard of care, you know, traditional medicine, Western medicine, it's kind of this is what we learned. If you have a thyroid issue, you take levothyroxine. Again, that is a T4. And if that person's not converting to T3 and or they're blocking that T3, they will never feel optimal taking T4 only. So working uh, with a compounding pharmacy like I do, the Integrative Hormone Center, we compound thyroid. So we do T3, T4 together. Sometimes I just do T3. Um, you know, lots of different schools of thought on should people just be treated with T3 or do they need some T4 in there as well? So if somebody's on Synthroid, which most people are, correct, um, and they just don't feel like it's helping, you know, well, this doesn't seem to be making me feel better. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that it's not converting well. Correct. So maybe tell us a little bit more about that. What's happening in that conversion process? So there's something that blocks that. Um, thyroid's very complicated. It's just not that thyroid gland making those hormones. It has to do with all of your endocrine systems and your mitochondria and your DNA and everything else. But what we have seen to be kind of interfering factors can certainly be environmental toxins, uh, chemicals in food, again, a viral insult, a bacterial insult, um, stress can just cause that thyroid to dysfunction or for that reverse to go up. So the thyroid's just very sensitive to food we eat and the stress right. and infections and toxins, and mm -hmm. so you could be getting the right medication for the right numbers, but mm -hmm. it's just not working. Mm -hmm. uh, not because it's a bad medication, but just because something in your body is really interfering. And I really feel that there's something that blocks at the receptor site. My goal in life is to figure that out. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I have patients come in and we start on thyroid, maybe they're better for a bit, and then I slide backward. And then we make an adjustment and they're better for a little bit and they slide backward. And then, you know, we keep doing that process. And I'm like, what is the problem? Where is the block? And no one has really figured that out yet. But in my opinion, there's something at the receptor site 
that that T3-4 hormone doesn't attach to. You mean like a toxin? Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my guess as well. Yeah. You know, we know that mercury gravitates to the thyroid. We know that yep. lead. Yep. Uh, we even know that plastics and BPA. Yep, absolutely. Um, so many of those things can be blocking, even though you are you have an excellent doctor and, and, you, and he knows how to read his labs and he mm -hmm. gave you good medication, but there's this missing mysterious Correct. piece that's just blocking the ability of a, a good effective therapy to work. Mm -hmm. um, but also I love how you guys think outside the box and use compounded, you use mm -hmm. T3, different um, formulations besides mm -hmm. just Synthroids. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, so help us understand a bit more. You mentioned Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. Help us understand a bit more about that. Uh, what's the difference between hypothyroidism versus Graves' disease versus Hashimoto's? Okay. Well, Graves can be caused by Hashimoto's. So Hashimoto's is the autoimmune thyroid. Um, that page that had the thyroid pathway, you'll see two different antibodies listed there. One is called thyroglobulin, which is the viscous fluid within the thyroid gland where hormone conversion can occur. The other is thyroid peroxidase antibody, which means something in general is attacking the thyroid gland. So as with any autoimmune condition, it is inflammation. Um, what causes that autoimmune condition? Again, a lot of theories on that. Um, certainly it can be genetic where certain people will come in. My grandmother has lupus. My grandfather had type 1 diabetes. My sister has uh, scleroderma. Um, another sister has Hashimoto. So sometimes it's genetic in that someone will have that autoimmune condition. Other times we don't have that connection. No, nobody in my family has autoimmune that I'm aware of. Um, you know, I remember grandma had a big thing on her neck. Oh, she probably had it. But um, <laughs> a lot of times it's, it's not that. And so again, it's those theories that we believe have caused that autoimmune response. So it's, again, a viral insult, a major stress, a bacterial insult, um, surgery, something that has disrupted the system that the body now has gone down a pathway of inflammation. So symptom-wise, um, what might someone think, well, maybe I have hypothyroidism versus too much thyroid, Graves? So Graves is, is too much. That's all the opposite of the hypo, right? So hypothyroid, everything is slowed down or sluggish. With Graves or hyperthyroid, everything is sped up. So a lot of anxiety, jittery, uh, major weight loss, just tremulous, internal vibratory sensations, just like everything in the system is sped up. And what would the testing or treatments be for Graves' disease? So the testing should be the same, that, that hormone pathway and looking at the antibodies and seeing exactly what's going on. Typically, the treatment for a hyperthyroid is to do radioactive iodine, um, if there's a goiter or nodules on the thyroid and it's extremely enlarged, sometimes it will be removed. Uh, sometimes medication is used to control the symptoms. Oh, and that's methimazole? Methimazole. Okay, I said it wrong. <laughs> and what is the action of that medication? I've always wondered that. It, it just helps to, um, you know, give that thyroid, move that TSH up. So, so TSH is opposite of what a person thinks when you look at test results. So, for example, if the reference range for TSH is 0 0.4 to 4.5, people will call, oh, my gosh, my TSH is so low, I need thyroid. No, it's opposite of what you think. When the number is elevated, it's hypo. When it's lower, or if it were way below the range, it would be more hyper. Yeah, that can be very confusing it to is. people. It's like, my numbers are low. Yes. Well, that's because your body's not telling your thyroid to make more because there's right. too much. Right. So it's sort of like counterintuitive. It can be. Right. It, it is that, you know, negative feedback kind of loop system, you know, that, again, involves a lot of different organs and things that saying there's too much, you need to slow down production, or there's not enough, you need to speed up production. But whether or not the body complies with that, is the answer. <laughs> now, do you, okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you have an ideal range that you like? Do you have like an optimal range? 
I go on how the patient feels. Okay. So, you know, a lot of my patients will have a very suppressed TSH, and some family doctor will check that, and you're going to have a heart attack, and you're going to have this and that, and who is managing this thyroid? But again, they're not looking at the panel. Huh? So if, if even if their TSH is suppressed, looking like, oh, you're getting too much thyroid, they're not having those symptoms, and they have normal T3, T4, and they're not blocking it, I don't care about the TSH. But as far as optimal numbers, it's how the patient feels. Mm -hmm. And so um, just to keep pressing in on the differences so people might have an idea. So Graves, you're going to be more jittery, more hyped mm -hmm. up, heart yeah. racing. Yes. And so for that, we, wanna, we want to raise that TSH. Correct. And for hypothyroidism, you're cold, you're sluggish, you're constipated, you're depressed, your hair is falling out. You're, um, do you know why people lose their eyebrows, the outer part of their eyebrows? It's just one of the symptoms, and it's very classic. Uh -huh. I mean, when somebody can sit in front of me, and before they even start with their symptoms, if they've lost the outer third of their eyebrow, <laughs> they have a thyroid issue. Yeah. And it goes along with the hair loss or thinning, too, that they experience. Mm -hmm. And then Hashimoto's. So my limited understanding is that you can fluctuate back and forth. Is that right? With yeah, with, the, with those antibodies, they can go up and down again because we don't always know what's driving the autoimmune response. So we know that it's inflammation because it's autoimmune. So we talk to the patient about diet. What are you consuming that's inflammatory? Are you eating a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of gluten, um, things that we know can cause inflammation. Are you, is dairy an issue for you? You know, if you eat a bowl of pasta, are you feeling achy and miserable and bloated and headachy the next day or a couple of days after? That's an issue with gluten. So when I have a patient diagnosed, that I diagnose with Hashimoto's, and it's extremely common, um, I always refer him to a book called The Root Cause by Isabella Wentz, kind of a guru in Hashimoto's management. Uh, she's actually a pharmacist by education, was diagnosed with something in college, and no one could really tell her what was wrong, or I hear even a lot from endocrinologists. Well, my endocrinologist said I had Hashimoto's, but nothing to worry about. Um, so she did a lot of research on her own, and hence the title of the book, Root Cause. So she kind of delves into some of the things that we know are inflammatory. So, you know, gluten's bad for everybody, period, end of story. You went um, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, what I do with patients is I challenge them to a 30-day grain elimination. So no grain, no wheat, no corn, no rice, no barley, no couscous, nothing in that grain group for 30 days. Protein, vegetables, fruits, nuts, nut butters, then you let, email me in a month and let me know what your symptoms are. And 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm not so foggy, I'm not so achy, I don't have so much GI issues. You know, then I say, well, there's something in that grain group that's a problem. So just like when we feed our children, we give them one thing, wait and see how that works. So I'll say, okay, well, you're a lot better, so something's a problem. You can add oatmeal. Wait a couple weeks. Are you having any issues? You're probably okay with oatmeal. Okay. Now you can maybe add corn, so corn chips, corn tortillas, same kind of thing. Never gluten uh, for somebody with Hashimoto's. If they tell me after that 30 days, I don't feel any different. Okay, well, probably nothing in that grain group is a real problem, although I'm not a big fan of the gluten. Um, then we kind of do it with dairy. So it's typically dairy or something in the grain group that really drives a lot of inflammation with Hashimoto's. Okay, so diet can make a huge difference. Very and much. so that's part of your treatment protocol. Correct. And so um, it's, it's a painful process for most of us. It but is. <laughs> it's, you know, when you feel better, right. it's just so worth it. it I, I don't miss gluten anymore. I don't mm -hmm. miss those things because I... I like to feel better. Yeah, and there's a lot, you know, a lot of other choices now. I mean, every time you go to a restaurant, there's always the menu always says this is gluten free, or you know, so that it's easier to eat that way than it was you know, it, 20 yeah. years. Ago. 
Yeah, most places have gluten-free menu now. Mm-hmm. Um, so what changes have you seen in the last 20 to 30 years around thyroid health? And why do you think that's happening? Oh, a lot more Hashimoto's, a lot more autoimmune. Like I said, I've been in healthcare almost 50 years, and then it was very rare to see someone with autoimmune. It's like, oh, this patient has MS or RA, call the troops, you're ne- you know, you never know, and you might see this again. And now, you know, I don't know what percentage of people coming to the office have some sort of autoimmune condition, and much younger women. Mm. And even children. Yes. Yeah. Um, Yeah, this is something that I'm extremely passionate about. So uh, I'll be talking about some of that too. But uh, I think when I hear my children's age group talking, Mm -hmm. show my age here, um, they just, I think they feel that it's just normal that most of them know somebody with an autoimmune. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm old enough to remember the day I didn't know anybody with an autoimmune right. condition. And, you know, working in the hospital, I just, you didn't hear about that. Right. So right. it really has exploded. It's really sad. It really <laughs> exploded in the last 20 years. Um, let's talk about genetics. So you mentioned genetics. Mm-hmm. Do you have a personal theory about how much you think genetics is playing in versus environment? I think it's more environmental, Mm -hmm. toxins and chemical exposures. So, you know, I always say I feel like Little House on the Prairie when I say this, but um, I grew up in northern Minnesota near Canada. My dad hunted, my dad fished, we knew the farmer to get a side of beef, they put the milk on your doorstep, everybody had a garden, everybody canned, there's a bakery to make fresh, you know, bread and rolls or whatever. No fast food restaurants. Um, you know, it was just clean, clean. And now we don't have that. So my theory on why we see so much autoimmune, and particularly in younger women, is that their formative years have been eating chemicals and breathing chemicals and drinking chemicals. Cannot agree with you more. Um, when the Gen Zs and the you know, the younger uh, adults come in my office, I tell them, you are the first generation who grew up your whole life with Roundup sprayed on your food. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm old enough to um, have lived in a day where we just didn't have that. I mean, all of our food was organic. And now organic is like this, oh, well, that's something I can't afford. Right. But that's the way food always was. Yes. For all of human history. Mm -hmm. And now with it, Um, most foods having pesticides and herbicides in them, Mm -hmm. I think we are having an explosion of these things. So Mm -hmm. I appreciate you speaking into that. Um, We have just about two or three minutes left. Oh, gosh. (laughs) I know. Can you believe that? (laughs) That went fast. (laughs) I could listen to you for an hour. Um, If if there was something just from your heart that you could say to the audience tonight, because I imagine that there's a number of people in this room who... Uh, did come here suspe- suspecting that they have thyroid illness or mm-hmm. hormonal mm-hmm. because you do way more than thyroid. I right, just want right. to be clear about that. <laughs> you know, the um, the doctors and the nurse practitioners at the Happy Hormone Clinic, they do a phenomenal job with hormones. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know I'm sort of going all over the place here, but um, I just I just love and appreciate what you offer so much. And yet if there's anything that you could say to the people in this room tonight, just from your heart, what, what would it be? Listen to yourselves. You know, you know you better than anyone else. You live in your body. So if you are saying, I really feel that I have a thyroid condition or I have this or I have that, you know, seek it out. You know, be an advocate for yourself because there are a lot of places now, like Teresa's practice here too, more holistic. People are wanting more of a functional approach, more of a holistic approach. Find a practitioner that's going to listen to you and validate you and help you get to optimal health. I mean, who wants to live to 90 if they have all kinds of health issues and taking all kinds of medicine? I'm here to, I'll say at 70 years old, take my bioidentical hormones. Don't look like it. <laughs> Take my bioidentical hormones and a bunch of uh, vitamins. And, you know, that's how I want it. I don't want to be putting those chemicals in there. So, you know, it's hard work. It's hard work to be healthy. But obviously the people in this room are health-focused. So you wouldn't be here if you weren't wanting to take a better look at health or a more functional approach to it. So listen to yourselves. You know yourself better than anybody. And find somebody that will validate that. I love what you just said. You know, what I kind of heard you saying is, 
fight for yourself. Right. You know, if your doctor tells you, well, your TSH is normal, mm -hmm. but you have many of the symptoms like Dr. Nelson was talking about, then maybe you come see her, you mm -hmm. know, or yeah. someone at the Happy Hormone Cottage. So. so I know we're running out of time, but I just wanted to say the other, some of the other pages in your handout are some of the environmental Agents that interfere with thyroid functioning, we touched on that a little bit, the pesticides, herbicides, plastic. You know, I always love it when the patient comes in and I get a dietary recall and, oh, well, I have a lean cuisine for lunch. Oh, that's great. You know, there's a whole uh, paragraph of chemicals that you just heat it up in plastic, which is releasing yet another xenoestrogen. So, you know, people, what people perceive to be healthy is not. But there's some environmental things there. Um, we talked about, you know, the standard American diet, viruses, bacteria, um, Hashimoto's. So then there, there is some page about some nutrients that are very important for thyroid functioning that you can just read through. So, you know, whatever you can do to help that thyroid in regard to zinc, B vitamins, selenium, um, magnesium, those kind of things. You just hooked me on something. You mentioned xenoestrogens. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little more about that. So xenoestrogens are um, hormone-appearing, estrogen-appearing substances to the body. So I'm very passionate about bioidentical hormone replacement and that women should be on it indefinitely. And my, my thought on that and how I explain it is, if you don't make your hormones and you don't replace your hormones, those receptor sites for the hormones are not going to sit empty. So the body's going to look for something that looks like a hormone. And those are those xenoestrogens. So herbicides, pesticides, plastic when it's heated, the environmental toxins, food additives. Like we were just saying, people used to eat food. Yes. It was food. Yeah. <laughs> not plastic. <laughs> not plastic and yeah. not something that, you know, again, lists a paragraph of non-food items. If there's a paragraph of non-food items, you're not eating food. Um, so so the, the body looks to those kind of things as a hormone. So if you're not making those hormones or replacing those hormones, it's those xenoestrogens that are going to sit on those receptors. And they don't fit there. Now, is that going to go in the cell and cause a problem? We don't know because there's no research, right? But what our bodies make is not harmful to us. When something goes down a different pathway or something interferes, then you have health issues or potential cancer and things like that. Artificial substances, things yeah. that weren't meant to be in That's the body right. can cause a heck of a lot of trouble. Um, I could just talk to you for another hour. Uh, I just love learning from you. Um, such a wealth of knowledge. Um, but sadly, we're down to our last three minutes. So